As a scientist, I'm often asked about my work, and it's something that goes like this. So, your research, how's it helpful? Will it help cure disease, treat cancer, benefit society in any way? And so I find myself trying to justify the benefits of what I'm doing. It's really easy to forget my core internal motivation, what drives me as a scientist. Because honestly, for me, since I was a kid and up until this day, it was always about eagerness to understand how the world works, driven by this pure curiosity. As a scientist, I'm constantly amazed by how much we can alter what's possible in this world by simply noticing inconsistencies, being curious, and asking powerful questions. And actually, these sorts of motivation is what drives humans forward throughout evolution. Think about how much we achieved by simply being curious and doing basic science. In the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to take you on the same scientific journey of possibilities and discoveries, as we take a look at something that affects you all very intimately. Your genetics. We will discuss how classical genetics fail to provide satisfying explanations for some of the most fundamental phenomena, the emergence of life. We now know that the true story involves what we sometimes call epigenetics. And it tells us that our DNA, or at least its expression, is by far more flexible than we thought. So thinking about how best to describe this to you, it occurred to me that perhaps the best analogy is something that is hidden in something that we do all day these days. And I mean texting. Now, I have to say that, although I'm a scientist, I was able to convince somebody to marry me. <laughs> and so a common texting between my wife and me goes something like this. So it's a hectic afternoon, my wife texts, hey, hon, did you remember to take the girls to swimming lessons? And me, who completely forgot, then responds, ah, I got, got lost at track at work, we'll take them up as soon as possible. Now starts the begging phase, texting, Honey, honey, no response. <laughs> now I'm trying to evaluate how much damage did I do. Honey, and again, no response. And then you get this. OK, fine. <laughs> now, we all know that OK, fine can be expressed in different ways, right? Can be, OK, fine, you did something very well. Or, OK, fine. And the difference between the way she will express it is essentially the difference between a long, cold night on the couch than dodging a bullet, right? And this is a very good analogy for epigenetics. Because the DNA, that's the text, that's the constant. But the epigenetics allows us to interpret it or express it in many different ways. So it seems like that the DNA has a, has a director that allows it to be expressed in many different ways. But few words about the text, the DNA. In each one of the billion cells of our body, we have molecules that stores information. Our code, the DNA. This information codes for, for how to make functional cells work both individually and in collaboration with other cells to form organs and tissues. It can be viewed as a textbook comprised of random letters that sometimes form meaningful words. For example, some of us were really less fortunate in the boldness gene lottery. Now, classical genetics proposed a model in which our DNA is the full story determining from the color of our eyes to our hair color, intelligence, and propensity to get certain diseases. But as scientists, we find inconsistencies with this as the full picture. Specifically, what we sometimes see is that the same text can be expressed in different ways. And I'd like to share several examples with you now. If we take a look, for example, at identical twins, 
So they have exactly the same DNA, and sometimes they really do look alike, but we know that there are different personalities, different individuals, sometimes even get different diseases, the effects of nurture, right? So how is it that the same DNA gives rise to such different phenotypes in the end? But maybe even more profoundly, in some cases of insects, like in ants, the same DNA can code for completely different, distinct features, both physical and uh, functional within the nest. So in this group of ants, for example, the same exact DNA can give rise to the queen and to the worker and to the miner. And they share completely distinct physical features, but also behaviors within the nest. So how is it possible that the same DNA give rise to such different features? But maybe even more fundamentally, if we take a look at the billion dollar question, in development, how does that from one genome, which is embedded in all our cells, we get so many cell types? So we all know that after egg and sperm meet, we call this fertilization, we get one copy from our dad and one copy from our mom. And these two copies of DNA are then embedded in, in our cells, but in all our cells of the body. Now, Following fertilization, what happens is that there are cell divisions. The embryo becomes, with the amount of cells in the embryo becomes larger, so two, four, and there are cell divisions, although the embryo stays in the same size, until we get into the stage of the blastocyst. In the side of the blastocyst, which, which will then be implanted in the uterus, these tiny cells are the notoriously famous embryonic stem cells. But interestingly enough, each one of these stem cells holds exactly the same DNA, but they still give rise to completely different cell types that comprise our body. How is it possible? So what is epigenetics in practice, and how can it bridge the gap in our understanding of this puzzling example that I just shared with you? So in order to explain this, I would like you to think of a different metaphor now. Let's imagine a single gene as a light bulb and an on-off switch. So in classical genetics, if we would like to turn off the light, for example, what we would have to do is to affect the sequence. We would have to introduce a mutation, like breaking the cord. We would have to, we would have to change the sequence itself. But epigenetics allows different mechanism. A mechanism in which we can just simply turn on and off the light by switching on and off the light switch. And this solves the problem, because epigenetics allows regulating genes or silencing the lamp, but without changing the text itself. Now, in each one of our cells, we don't have a single gene. We have multiple genes, more than 20,000 genes. So let's imagine a panel of genes, panel of lights, that is embedded in each one of our cells. And this solves the problem, because although each cell contains the same panel, the different patterns of them is what affects cell cellular identity. So brain cells will have different patterns, while heart cells, for example, will have different patterns and bone cells, for example, will have different patterns, and blood cells will have different patterns of on-off light. So certain genes will turn on, while others turn off. Now, in development, what's happening is that a single stem cell has the full potential. All the lights are on. And then, as single cells take their journey in development, they start silencing several of these genes while activating others or these lights. But it's not a change in the code itself. It's the change in the epigenetic patterns that, dicta that dictates. And this gives the variety of all our cell types. Now, I would like us to think together and ask, like scientists, 
a powerful question. Let's ask a radical question together. So if it's all about turning on and off the genes, or the lights in this case, can we simply take a single gene, a single cell that already have its identity, and revert it back in time by simply turning all the, all the lights on? Can we revert back development? This experiments conducted by John Gordon and Shinya Yamanaka awarded them the Nobel Prize. What John Gordon did is that he took a skin cell with certain pattern of on and off lights, introduced it into an egg, and this completely wiped out the expression of all the light, turned on all the lights. This is what we call cloning. Now, Yamanaka did the same by introducing a combination of viruses, and again, completely wiped out and activated all the lights. So, from a single cell that already acquired its identity, like a skin cell, we now get stem cells again. Think how remarkable it is. These cells now can choose again their fate. Now, what do we do in our lab? In our research, we strive to understand exactly the same processes we would like to understand how development takes place and all these changes in activation of certain genes by the, the epigenetic factors. Previously, what we could do in the field is only measure the endpoints, like taking snapshots. For example, we could look at blood cells, we could look at stem cells, and see their pattern of lights. But now, we develop new technologies that allows us to take a look at individual cells as they go down these routes and see how changes in the light affects their identity. But even more than that, we can now manipulate individual light and see how it affects cells. Isn't that remarkable? We can change actively some of these lights and see how it affects cellular identity. Now, why is it good for you? or how from basic science and possibilities we can have so much impact that may affect society. So, if we'll understand, for example, how to program these stem cells into specific fates in development, one can think of manipulating these cells and making them every cell type that we would like. So we can introduce a stem cell and get at the other side of the, of, of, the, of the path a neuron, for example, to implant to Parkinson patients where, where their uh, dopaminergic neurons are affected, or spinal cord injury, motor neurons, even beta cells for patients with diabetes. So if we we'll understand exactly the paths that these cells take in development, we will be able to recapitulate that to make a lot of cells for cell replacement therapies. Another remarkable paradigm that we are interested in is aging. If we take a look at the same individual when he was old and when he was young, and we take, for example, a biopsy, and we measure the DNA within this, for example, skin cells, then the DNA is practically the same. There is not a lot of changes, and even if there are changes, there are very, very random, and cannot explain su such robust process like aging. Nevertheless, if we take a look at the panel of epigenetics, this panel of lights, then it goes completely bad. Can, similar to what we did in single cell, that we can now reprogram them back, activate all the lights, can we in some way, some way prevent aging, make it slower? Can we do it on the organ, tissue level, complete individual level? These are remarkable questions that we can now start to ask with current tools. The same is true for several complex diseases like cancer, neurodegeneration diseases, like Parkinson and Alzheimer, where we can't find a common mutation in the code itself, in the DNA, 
but we do see a lot of changes in the light pattern, in the epigenetics. We now have unprecedented tools to start asking causality relationships between these changes and the outcome. Lastly, we believe that environment may affect our epigenome. Perhaps that's the best mechanism in which that can interact with environment. We all are under a lot of stress, of course. Stress from environment, stress from daily routines, even effects of nutrition. Can these environmental effects, both external but also internal within ourselves, between ourselves, can leave a mark, can leave an epigenetic change. So if it happens in our body, it might cause disease, neurodegenerative disease, but even more radically, can these changes affect our germ cells? These are the cells that will give rise to the sperm and the egg. If this holds true, it might be that environmental changes that are imposed on, I, on us ourselves throughout our life may be transmitted to the next generation. And if this holds to be true, then we would have to reevaluate the way we understand evolution. So it would be far more flexible than we thought. But that's a complete new different TED talk. I'd like to thank you for taking this journey with me today. I hope I, I convinced you that from basic curiosity and basic science comes really great possibility that can benefit society. I hope it really piqued your curiosity to ask powerful questions, to be curious. It turned on the inner lights within you. And thank you for listening.